At the time of filming this video, the number one album, not just in country music, but in all genres, is Zach Bryan's self-titled LP, which just debuted with almost 200,000 units in its first week. At the same time, the number one song in the country for two weeks running is Oliver Anthony's viral smash, Rich Men North of Richmond. And this is obviously a big moment for country music, although neither of these songs embody any of the modern stereotypes of what people say country music is like. I mean, where are all the lyrics about tailgates and beers? Where are the snap tracks and TikTok dance? And furthermore, where's the Yeehaw version of twerking? I'm killing and I be that way. And I was about to ask, where is the white boot brigade of sorority sisters lining up to buy tickets? But that would actually be a totally incorrect question because they're buying tickets to the Zach Bryan concert. And that's because this music is cool. This music is the zeitgeist right now. Country music in general has been having a giant pop culture moment this year with hits like Fast Car and Last Night by Morgan Wallen and Try That in a Small Town by Jason Aldean. But right now we are at the zenith of this alternative scene in country music or this independent scene in country music or this grassroots part of country music suddenly becoming part of the mainstream in a huge way. And when I look around at the industry and see Charles Wesley Godwin signing with Big Loud and I see Sam Barber and Wyatt Flores blowing up on TikTok and moving tons of tickets at their shows and a new country festival launching every two seconds, it's just clear that country and specifically alternative country is cool. And yes, I know the seeds of this movement were planted long ago and over the past decade, the success of Jason Isbell and Sturgill Simpson and Tyler Childers were these huge bellwethers that this change was coming, but it's really been galvanized in the past couple years, especially with Zach Bryan, who I think you could credibly argue is almost in the same position within country music that Nirvana was in in rock music 30 years ago. Go with me here on this metaphor. If we rewind all the way back to the 1980s, the most popular, coolest, zeitgeisty music in America was glam rock, hair metal, with everything from bands like Def Leppard and Kiss, all the way into acts like Motley Crew, Twisted Sister, Bon Jovi, and maybe most synonymous with the term hair metal, Poison. Their music was not necessarily deep and thought-provoking and tackling major issues in the world, but it was fun. It was irreverent. It was crazy and colorful. The hair was big, the makeup was big, and the crowds were even bigger. This style of music was so popular that labels invested crazy money into developing all sorts of bands. I mean, even in researching for this video, I learned of like a dozen acts I'd never even heard of. People like Striper, Enough's Enough, and Rat. But it was a little grungy rock band from Seattle called Nirvana that released their debut album Bleach in 1989 that many would argue put an end to the hair metal era. When Smells Like Teen Spirit became an unexpected smash in 1991, the record industry was left kind of scratching its head at how the youth would like this. She's sloppy aesthetic and droning vocals, mumbled verses with screamy distorted choruses and themes of social dejection and apathy. But the youth did like it, and in fact liked it so much that the album it came from, Nevermind, became a true social phenomenon, being certified diamond for sales of over 10 million copies. The public's taste is fickle and can change on a dime, and for whatever reason, in the early 90s, they were no longer interested in eating cherry pie or having sugar poured on them. They wanted to live in the tortured mind of Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Perhaps in a time of great American wealth, people were craving a little bit of pain in their music. That's not for me to answer, I'm not a rock historian, but it doesn't take a genius to recognize what happened with Nirvana coming along and ushering in an entire new aesthetic, the rise of grunge rock, and to see over the course of the 90s how bands like R.E.M. and Pearl Jam became popular, how themes of dejection and being social outcasts and a real punk energy became what was cooler than the mainline themes of sex and fun that defined the hair metal era. And eventually that opened the gate further down the road for bands like Green Day and ultimately Blink-182 and Sum 41, and how that style was so different than the decade before it. Now switching into country music, you might argue that 10 years ago, the bro country era, 
was its own version of the hair metal era. In fact, some journalists have even argued this point as long as nine years ago in The Guardian. Oh wait, that was me with my article. Now coming full circle and making a whole video about it. Bro country was defined by hot tan legs, swinging off tailgates and drinking beer and partying out in the field. Songs like Cruise and Country Girl Shake It For Me and My Kind of Party defined the genre. And it makes total sense when you look at someone like Scott Borchetta who signed Florida Georgia Line and see that his favorite band is Motley Crue. There is a simple, visceral, lusty vibe in both and it makes for very fun music and also very dumb music that is easily replicated and was easily replicated and we've all heard the arguments about bro country. And if you haven't, just go watch my first video on this channel, Why Country Music Was Awful in 2013. This sound became so stereotyped that bands like Maddie and Tay could win with protest anthems against the ubiquity of Bro Country with Girl in a Country song. And while Bro Country has largely gone out of style and Florida Georgia Line isn't even a group anymore, and we've seen independent artists like Jason Isbell, like Tyler Childers have huge success, there hasn't really been a Nirvana moment, or at least there hadn't been. Now, it's happened, officially, and the Kurt Cobain in this instance is Zach Bryan, who not only had a giant smash with American Heartbreak last year, but over doubled that album's debut for his new self-titled one, with almost no promotion and no lead single. That's kind of how cool he is. And just like the industry had to figure out why Nirvana was popular and swallow their own pride and accept that, yeah, this is what the kids like, the country music industry is continuing to learn they're going to need to reckon with this sound being the cool sound of country music in order to to move forward and stay relevant. And I think there already has been a lot of evidence of Nashville, which typically only likes to support stuff that is produced in Nashville, really being open to accepting the kind of influence of music from outside of its borders. You have major Nashville labels signing people like Luke Grimes, who's popular from the show Yellowstone. Or Colby Acuff, who also wants to have a more lo-fi cowboy aesthetic. You have the Opry buying a stake in Whiskey Riff, which has always been this like stepchild media company company of the country music landscape that is like F Nashville and covering artists out of the Texas and red dirt scenes with way more fervor. You have Zach Bryan's Something in the Orange actually getting pushed as a radio single rather than it just being a viral online track. Artists are totally participating in this as well. You have Luke Combs bringing 49 Winchester with him on tour. You have collaborations that bridge the gap between Nashville and Texas where a guy like Co Wetzel will invite Ernest to come write with him and William Beckman. I have a feeling in the next two years the labels are gonna be signing a lot of people that they think are just like Zach Bryan. It's gonna be a lot of somber two chord songs going back and forth of people yelling passionately up into the sky. And they should hope that they can be one ounce as poetic as Zach in the lyrics because otherwise that style is gonna fall flat. But for now, I'm not whining about it. I think it's cool. We're in the midst of a full on country music revolution and not since the early 90s when you had Garth flying around on wires and Alan Jackson water skiing on the Chattahoochee and then Brooks and Dunn and Billy Ray Cyrus and the whole line dance revolution. Has country music been as cool in the broader pop culture landscape as it is right now? Like three times this year, the top three songs on the whole Hot 100 have been country songs and that hadn't happened in like 30 years. And literally as I'm sitting here editing this, Zach Bryan's collaboration with Casey Musgraves, I Remember Everything, is now the new Hot 100 number one. When kids go audition on American Idol or The Voice, they're singing Tyler Childers. They're singing Whiskey Myers. Yellowstone is the biggest show on cable and regularly showcasing all of this alternative country music or Texas and Oklahoma artists. Luke Combs is winning Entertainer of the Year at the CMAs and claiming, This is my fifth or sixth year being at this award show and country sounded more country than it has in a long time tonight. And I think we all wanted that. I love y'all. And you got people like Lainey Wilson and John Party that are both radio relevant, but very proud to make country music with a more traditional twist. Even just the aesthetics of mullets and big belt buckles and light wash jeans, as well as boots and cowgirl hats, all of that's cool right now. And it honestly reminds me of this quote from the book Country Music that was a companion to the Ken Burns documentary where they were talking about Garth Brooks. His attitude was, let them come to us. Let's be so good at what we do that they come to us and leave pop radio or whatever kind of radio and come listen to country. 
And when they do, Brooks added, they're going to get to hear Vince Gill, Alan Jackson. So that was our job to anybody that said, hey, I don't know anything about country music. Well, come over, and while you're here, take a look around because you're going to be impressed. It wasn't about being hip, Kathy Matea said. I think country music had kind of been self-conscious for a long time about, are we cool? Do the big people in New York accept us? Are we kind of the unwanted stepchild? Are we kind of the afterthought? And all of a sudden, this guy is selling out stadiums and doing specials and blowing the tops off record sales across the board. And he's one of us. All bets are off right now, and I think country music is gonna be so damn fun for the next two years because it's not gate kept by anyone. The industry's trying to figure out, oh shit, how did we miss the boat? That there's this whole alternative uprising happening and the internet's gonna decide on its own stars without any of our curation of sending artists to be on like the damn Today Show summer concert series as if that makes any difference when TikTok is around. The Appalachian movement is gaining steam left and right, so much so that Radio WV, a little channel filming people in the woods, can launch Oliver Anthony into an overnight superstar where he's playing on Rogan and has like the banjoist from Mumford and Sons asking to be in his band instead. And then you've got major label artists that are now stepping back and being like, should I be spending a ton of money on a glossy music video when it seems like I should just go set up my phone and sing outside in the wilderness since people like this aesthetic and this stripped back acoustic sound more. But this independent spirit that's gonna be alive in the mainstream for the next few years, I view as such a win for music even if, I bet, ultimately, it's going to become derivative at some point, and then tastes will be fickle again, and all the young people will start to kind of not associate with the brooding acoustic vibes, and it'll feel like chuggy, or whatever word they have for that at that time. Because to go back to our rock metaphor, you go a decade after Nirvana, into the early 2000s, when rock was so ingrained, both in public consumption and in industry output, that the biggest bands were making what the people called butt rock, and you had Daughtry and Nickelback and Creed, and they were very popular, but it was at that point that it became a punchline, just like hair metal had, and the crowd moved on again. That will probably happen with this sound, and that's fine. I'm fine with us not being the top of the totem pole, but while we are, I feel like the floodgates are open, all bets are off, and all sorts of country music, from the folkier stuff to the club remixes of country, is all gonna be able to thrive. And I'm just excited by it. Who knows? Are we gonna get into line dancing again? Even if it means that inevitably that era has to come to a close, and in 10 years, country music's gonna be like, really bad again, and then we'll have something to fight for and be like, we need real music. I feel like that's just, you know, the older I get, that is the nature of life. Culture runs on these cycles, stuff gets ubiquitous, then it gets uncool, then it gets ghettoized, then it gets kind of slowly back to being cool, and you know, that happens for forever. So just uh, embrace the drama, I guess. So yeah, too long, didn't watch. I guess my point is, country music's in a cool spot. We are having our Nirvana moment. The industry is starting to react and the next few years are going to be wild. And I think in a few years, we're going to look back at this as a very special time in country music history. Let me know your thoughts. If you agree with this metaphor, if you think I am way off base, you're welcome to disagree. Just be cool about it in the comments. I'll be back with another video later this week and more country music content very soon. Okay. Bye.